So the groundhog lied. Um, but we're so glad that you're here worshiping with us. And if you're at home worshiping with us this morning, we see you and we are glad that you have tuned in with us. And uh, uh, I, I just would ask too, so who's more at fault, the groundhog or us for trusting a groundhog? And this morning, we're going to talk about trusting Jesus. So this is our second week in this series, Meals with Jesus, uh, in the Gospel of Luke. So go ahead and grab your Bible and go to Luke chapter 9. And uh, we are in a progressive dinner of sorts. Uh, It seems like in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was either going to a meal, he was at a meal, or he was coming from a meal. In fact, 10 meals, and we're working through all 10 of those meals. There's just something about gathering at a table and having a meal. Uh, Last night, Amy and I were at a table with others, uh, some that we gather around the table with fairly often, and others that we haven't been around the table with in a long time. And it was just a sweet time to gather around food and have conversation. And that's what we see. Jesus did so much of his ministry and his talk about the kingdom around a table and around food. Last week, we talked about how the table is open to everyone. Uh, Matthew threw a party at his house after Jesus called him to follow him, Uh, sinners came to the table, and Jesus makes the point, everyone is welcome at the table. This morning, we're going to skip ahead. We're not necessarily going to go in order that these meals are presented in the Gospel of Luke, but we're going to look at a story that you may be familiar with, and perhaps you had not thought of it being a meal that Jesus shared, but indeed it is. It's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus feeds 5,000, really over 5,000 people with some uh, bread and just a couple of fish uh, and this incredible miracle that he does. And so we're going to look at that from Luke chapter 9. By the way, you can jot this down. Uh, If you got a slap guide when you came in, uh, I'd encourage you to follow along on it this morning. If you're at home, uh, go to aldersgate.info and you can find the sermon notes there and you can follow along. Uh, But the the story of the feeding of the 5,000 actually shows up in all four of the Gospels. By the way, we're reading through the Gospels in 60 days as we work through this series. Uh, If you missed that and you want to join in on that, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, We're on about day eight today. Uh, You can pick up a hard copy in the Connections Lounge or again, go to aldersgate.info and you can find that reading plan there and you can join in. But you can also find this story uh, in Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, and John chapter 6. But since we're in Luke during this series, I'm going to read it out of Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 10. Here's what it says. On their return, the apostles. Now, Jesus had just sent out the apostles. Uh, They went to village, 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 village. They were healing, and they were sharing the gospel. And they come back, and they have all kinds of stories to share with Jesus, and he's about to give them a whopper, okay? And so on their return, the apostles told him all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew a Park to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away. Have you ever looked up and gone, oh my gosh, it's four o'clock already? Some of you are like, no, I never do that at my job. No, like you just, like the day's gotten away, right? Like, so Jesus has been preaching and teaching all day long. The day's gotten away. Certainly the people are hungry. And so here's what the disciples said. Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions. Here's what they meant. To find food because they're hungry, Jesus. You've been teaching all day long. They've had nothing to eat and they're hungry. And then here's what they said. Watch this. For we are here in a desolate place. Now, what they meant was there's no food around here. But here in a minute, we're going to see how we all find ourselves in a desolate place from time to time. Verse 13. But he said to them, to the disciples, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. We found out from other gospel writers that those five loaves and two fish were offered up by a little boy who was literally giving his lunch. We don't know if Jesus asked the disciples to go through the crowd and look for food or what happened, but nonetheless, they bring to Jesus this little boy's lunch, five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless, into verse 13, 
We are to go and buy food for all these people. Now here in just a minute, I'm going to tell you the disciples had four solutions to the people's hunger. And we often come up with four solutions to our own hunger. And we're going to look for those in this story. Verse 14, for there were about 5,000 men. First century writing, first century culture would only include the men in the group. So there was probably more like 10,000-ish people when you include women and children, or maybe even 15,000, some Bible experts say. Now, think about this, 15,000. I was trying to tell you in Lubbock, where would we find 15,000 people? Well, the United Supermarkets Arena holds 15,000 people. Okay, so the only other place in Lubbock you can find 15,000 people is in a United the day before Snowmageddon, okay? Um, But 15,000 people, think about it. I want you to envision the United Supermarkets Arena, even if you've never been in there. 15,000 people, Jesus fed all of those people with five loaves of bread and two fish. He said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. Now, isn't that interesting? We'll get there in a minute. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Now, perhaps you started to see some of the solutions that the disciples came up with to feeding these people. The first solution they came up with is, let them figure it out on their own. Let me say it this way. The first solution the disciples came up with is, let's not do anything. Let's just give up. Let's not do anything about feeding the disciples now, or feeding all these people. Listen, the people were hungry. Have you ever been hungry? You're like, yeah, in the morning, around noontime, and in the evening, right? <laughs> but, but most of us don't know hunger like some people around the world. I shared this in the 930 service. We prayed this morning uh, for the superintendents of the school districts in the area because tomorrow morning they're going to have a tif- difficult decision to make. Like they may have to delay or cancel school. I know there's some of you in the room. You're young, you want it canceled, right? But listen, I know the superintendents have a difficult decision making because they want everyone to be safe, but at the same time, they know that if they cancel school, there will be kids who don't eat tomorrow. Like, I've never known that kind of hunger. But listen, I have known the hunger of not having any hope, of not having the forgiveness that I so desperately wanted and needed, uh, of needing healing, whether that be physical or emotional, of needing a fresh start or finding purpose in life. Like we can relate to the crowd's hunger because we've all been in that place where we're hungry for something. If it's not food, we're hungry for something. And oftentimes we see the same solutions the disciples tried to give the people, we do for our own selves. And the first one is, God doesn't really care about me or my hunger. That request is so small. I would never think to take that to God. I've prayed over and over and over and nothing has happened. So we just give up. Or rather, we don't even start at all. Think about how silly that is, right? So like this afternoon, I don't know if you know this, spoiler alert, there's a football game. Did you know that? Some call it the Super Bowl. I refuse to call it the Super Bowl because it's only super if the Cowboys are playing in it, okay? So it's not the Super Bowl, thank you. Um, So hey, go red team, right? So um, I was in a conversation this morning. If the 49ers win, I have to preach in a 49ers jersey next Sunday. So please pray for the Chiefs to win, all right? Uh, How many of you are going for the 49ers, by the way? How many of you are going for the Chiefs? How many of you are going for more football and less Taylor? Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, The last time I looked, listen, the last time I looked, the 49ers are favored to win by two points. So should the Chiefs even show up to play? 
Really? They got my home, so they're going to win. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Right? So it would be silly to think that the Chiefs wouldn't show up to play just because they're not picked to win, right? But that's what the disciples did here. <laughs> There's no way, Jesus. So just send all the people home. How often do you and I do that in our own places of hunger? The things that we need from God, the places we need him to work, the things that we're so desperately longing for him to do is to just say, eh, why even start? Or to give up if we've been praying over and over and over and over and over. The second thing the disciples did is they came to Jesus and said, um, well, Actually, they didn't come to Jesus. What did Jesus say to them? You feed them. Right? And so they're like, um, okay. John's gospel tells us that one of the disciples said, uh, 200 denarii would not even come close to feeding all of these people. Do you know why that disciple said that in John's gospel? Because in John chapter 6, verse 6, here's what it says. Jesus already knew what he was going to to do. You see, sometimes when the responsibility is great or the need is great and the resources seem few, we think that we can use our own strength, our own control, our own power to determine the outcome we want. Not realizing that Jesus already knows what he's going to do. And oftentimes our solution in trying to use our own strength and our own control and our own power, we don't get to witness what Jesus already knows he wants to do in our life because we try to take control of the situation. That's what the disciples were going to do. Well, let's try to round up enough money so that we can... And Jesus is like, no, you have no idea what I'm about to do if you would just learn to trust me. And that's the third solution. They're getting a little bit closer. They bring the bread and the fish to Jesus. And so here's what they did, third solution. They start with what they had. Now, we don't know if Jesus asked them to go through the crowd and see what people had, or uh, we don't know if the disciples took that upon themselves to do that. Nonetheless, we know this boy had some bread and fish, and they bring it to Jesus, right? They're getting closer. Have you ever played that game, cold, cold, warm, warm, hot, right? That's where the disciples are getting. They started with, let's just not even do anything. Let's just give up. The second thing was, well, let's try to do it in our own power. The third thing was, hey, let's see what we have and go ahead and give that to Jesus, but even that, sometimes, we're not very good at, are we? It either seems too little, or it doesn't seem like it's the right thing, or it doesn't seem like, what could Jesus do with this, right? It's like the story uh, of the preacher. It's always about the preacher, right? There's a story of a preacher, and the town where his church was, uh, it came. there was a storm, a lot of flooding. The streets began to flood to the point where you couldn't drive down them. All you could do was get down them in a boat. And so the preacher is at the church. He's on the porch. The streets are flooded, and he's praying, Jesus, please save me. I have faith that you will save me. And this guy in a canoe comes up to the porch of the church and says, Preacher, you better get in. And the preacher's like, no, no, no. I'm praying God will save me. So the water continues to come. The floods continue to rise. Before long, the preacher's in the balcony of the church because the water's gotten that deep, and he's continuing to pray. And this guy now in a motorboat pulls up and says, Preacher, the levee's about to break. You need to get in this boat and get out of here. And he's like, Nope, I have faith in Jesus. Faith will deliver me. Jesus is going to come. He's going to take care of all of this. <laughs> the levee broke. And they say, you know, the preacher's on top of the roof of the church. The only thing left above the water is the steeple. He's clinging to the steeple, praying, Jesus, I have faith that you're going to save me. A helicopter comes over, drops a ladder from the helicopter. The guy from the helicopter, preacher, grab onto the ladder, get in the helicopter. And he's resolute in his faith that Jesus is going to save him. And he dies. But he goes to heaven. 
It's just a given with preachers. He goes to heaven. He gets to heaven. He gets an interview with God. And he says to God, God, why didn't you save me? I prayed over and over and over and over that you would save me, that, you, that I had faith and that you would take care of this. And God says to him, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. What else do you want? That's where the disciples were. Oftentimes we already have what Jesus is going to use to work the miracle in our lives. We have to surrender that to him, whatever that is. Sometimes, scripture even says this, it's the faith the size of a mustard seed. Just a little bit of hope, a, a little good news to cling on to, we bring that to Jesus. And then here's the fourth solution. The disciples are getting really hot now. They decide to trust Jesus. So they bring the bread. They bring the fish. They give it to Jesus. And here's what they witness. They witness Jesus take what he's been given. He took what they gave to him. He blessed it. Scripture says he gave thanks to heaven. He looked up. All the gospels tell us this. He looked up to heaven and gave thanks for what had been given. And then he broke it. And then watch this. He gave it back to the disciples. And the disciples began to take and pass around the bread and the fish. And here's what happened. The multiplication didn't happen when Jesus took it. It didn't happen when Jesus gave thanks for it. It didn't happen when Jesus broke it. The multiplication took place in the hands of the disciples. They had some bread and some fish, and they would go to this group of 50, and as they would pinch off a little bread and some fish and give it to someone in the group of 50, they would look back at their hand, and there was more than even what they had given out. That's how Jesus does it. When we're willing to give him what we have and trust him, he does a work in our life that we never would have asked or imagined. But we have to be willing to move past, well, there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to give up. Well, I'm not even going to start. Why should I even pray for that? We have to move past, well, I can do this in my own strength or my own power. I can take care of this on my own. We have to move past even going, okay, Jesus, I'll give this to you, but good luck. To Jesus, here's what I have. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to thank you for it. I'm going to let you break it. Oh, church, that's the hardest thing sometimes, is to trust Jesus in the breaking And then he gives it back to us and he says, I didn't need luck. I just needed you to take what you had, give it to me, and trust me with it. So wherever that place of hunger is for you this morning, you have the same solutions the disciples had in front of them in this story. You can choose to just say, oh, Jesus doesn't care about that. Or why should I even pray about that? Or why should I even, I mean, I've prayed this over and over and over and over. So I'm just going to quit or give up or not even start. There's the option or the solution where so many of us live. Or <laughs> hello, maybe I'm just talking to myself. I'm trying to solve it in my own power. Take care of it in my own control. Or we can surrender it to Jesus and trust him to do the miracle. This is my favorite part of the story. Not only did the bread and the fish multiply in the disciples' hands, after they gave out the bread and the fish to all the groups of 50, 
Jesus asked him to go through the crowd and pick up the leftovers. Leftovers? Leftovers. And here's what the gospels tell us. There wasn't just one basket of leftover bread and fish or two baskets of leftover bread and fish or three baskets of leftover bread and fish or four baskets of leftovers or five baskets or six baskets or seven baskets or eight baskets or nine baskets or 10 baskets of leftovers or 11 baskets but 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. One for each of the disciples. Now remember, they had just come back from being sent out by Jesus to share the gospel and to heal people in all the villages. And they had report after report after report after report to share with Jesus of all the crazy, incredible things that had happened. And Jesus is saying to them, you haven't seen anything yet. There's always more when you're willing to trust me. So Jesus, our prayer this morning is that we would trust you God, in those places that are very specific on our minds and our hearts right now, where we are hungry for whatever it is, hope, courage, relationship, forgiveness, a fresh start, purpose. God, this morning we ask that you would forgive us when we've taken the first solution of just not doing anything or giving up. We ask that you would forgive us when we've struggled in our own power, thinking that we can do it better than you. We ask for forgiveness when we even tried to offer up what we have to you, but kind of shook our hands and said, good luck. And God, this morning we would ask that you would give us the boldness to take what we have, bring it to you, and trust you. I'm going to ask the altar ministry team to come to the front. They'll be here. If you need prayer about any of these specific areas or any area. I'm also going to make you even more uncomfortable than that this morning. In our worship center, we have five different sections. On any given Sunday, there's about 50 people in each section. Go figure. Maybe this morning, Jesus just wants you to do something in the section where you're seated. There was significance to him asking the people to sit in groups of 50. So whatever it is, will you trust Jesus this morning?